Hello, hello, video time. It is nice, nice afternoon. And I cried like for most of the day. <laughs> and I cried real, real, real hard and deeply for like an hour last night in the dark at around 10 o'clock after I heard a massive sequence of gunshots out there on the street and when I heard that I was so so worried about the Bambi deer boy and um, when he came alone to our property I already knew that his mother and sister are probably shot by that hunter guy down there, down the hill. So, so, and I think that he got the baby boy too. This is the harsh reality of human neurosis. I see that as a pathology whether this is genetic or a combination of genetics and upbringing it probably is both it's, it's a pathology either way And why that brings up heavy feelings in me, absolutely heavy. And I had that feeling when the baby boy came to visit us. I had the feeling that he was in grief over his mother and sister because I heard him making these sounds, you know, like real high-pitched squealing kind of sounds, like a, I don't know, it sounded very strange. Like he was calling them, and like he said, don't leave me alone here among humans. Don't leave me alone. So then we had one or we had two nice days with the baby boy. He was hanging out at our in our garden and he was too afraid to leave, didn't leave. I gave him apples, he played with the papa dog, they danced with each other like back and forth. And then last night around nine thirty to PM. I don't I forgot know exactly when, but somewhere around that time. A hunt the hunter came and shot like I don't know, sounded like thirty bullets or something. Thirty shots. It sounded really bad. It sounded like war. And it reverberates here because this is the way this the landscape is it's rolling hills and these and any kind of sound echoes back and forth it sounded like war i was upstairs here standing over there by in front of the balcony door and looking out to the moon and the stars and suddenly these enormously loud shots like enormously loud probably a rifle 
a hunting rifle. A couple of years ago, I, ca I called the sheriff, and, and he actually laughed right at me. Ah, ha, ha. Ah, ha. I know that guy. He knows his laws. Good old boys know each other, protect each other. Police, supposed to police, supposed to protect the neighborhood, pro supposed to protect life. No, not willing to show up, not willing to help. That's his buddy. The neighbors on both sides. Oh, he was in the he was in the military or navy <coughs> or something. Oh, well, that explains it all. You know, <coughs> no, everything is justified. Uh, no, it's, it's not justified. Okay, that doesn't justify anything. <coughs> he served this country. Now he has the right to do anything he wants. Kill little girls. No, he doesn't have the right to do anything he wants to do with his neurosis, with his broken mind. Okay, he doesn't. The animals are my children. And if I ever come into that situation, I will protect them. I haven't come into that situation yet. And I hope I never will. We have to protect our loved ones, and I extend that to all living beings. When we communicate with people in, uh, as a regular everyday communication, and we see someone we don't like or someone triggers us, it is advised to use nonviolent communication at all times with this. But when your loved ones are threatened, there's no time in that moment. Okay, You don't have time. You have to act. And Jiddu Krishnamurti pointed that out, and even Dr. Marshall Rosenberg pointed that out as well. You have to act. You have to be protective of the other being. You have to protect and save the other being. And this ethics philosophy extends out into the whole world and also into every field and area and profession and corporation. It extends out that philosophy. Some people they go, oh, it ends here with my family. 
No, no, it doesn't. Going to war, that's not protecting loved ones. Going to war is violence. Most people don't know that. Okay, that's why it is so incredibly important that we have a school reform and that we have ethics philosophy as mandatory classes to teach in all schools, in all colleges. Mandatory classes that people when they get when they do a driver's license test they need to have rigorous ethics tests done as well rigorous like i don't know like 30 pages multiple choice ethics tests ethics evaluation and they need to learn this they need to read a whole book on ethics. For example, in Germany, where I'm from, they, the people there are, have an obligation, every citizen has an obligation to administer first help, first aid. Everyone has an obligation to help someone in need. Then I came to the United States and I see they don't have that here. Someone could be dying on the street with something, someone else beating someone, and you walk away and it has no jurisdictional consequences for you so right there we need to look at that really up close right there is a problem and this situation can be seen in the attitudes of people particularly in New York, the loneliest state in the United States with the most people. They live like sardines and are paranoid to the core of each other. This is a real bad situation and people kicked on the street, other people just walking away. Not just, uh, they're not just taught no responsibility, but we even have that in our legal system. So I think this is a real problem. This needs to be reformed. In Germany, we have mandatory classes on reviving someone, you know, doing paramedic work. This is part of getting a driver's license. You can't get German driver's license unless you take this paramedic course and pass it. Yeah, that's how that's how seriously they take this first aid and responsibility and ethics and taking care of someone who's in need of help. And this also needs to be extended to animals because animals are sentient and they're persons too in the same sense. For that, I have a petition. I will post the link under the video. And 
the baby boy Dia has not come back to our property. And it could be that the hunter shot the entire family. The entire family who I have been feeding apples to down by the garage, upstairs here by the lawn. They came in and they ate one of our tomatoes that was still green. I don't mind. I don't mind them eating the fruits and vegetables that we have there and and the blackberries. They eat blackberries and they take those very gently so that they don't get stung by the thorns. And they love apples, absolutely love apples. It's so sweet to feed them apples. I made a video also about this recently for my parents, talking how, how much I liked feeding the apples to the deer family, and now they're all gone. So we need to clearly differentiate between an encounter with someone and how we communicate with that person versus an emergency situation. So those are two different situation scenarios that ask for very, very radically different actions. Okay, In a situation of an emergency, if someone came after my family, I would not be afraid of that gun. If they had a gun, I would not be afraid. I would throw myself against that person, including the gun. And even if the gun shoots me or causes me suffering, I will do whatever I can. A gun will not work on me because I will throw myself against it with full force and very fast to protect my family. And that can turn the gun around and shoot the invader. So at least it gets very nasty. So, and that's what, mo that's why most criminals are afraid of dogs because dogs do that that they don't they don't recognize the gun they don't understand the implications of the gun i do but i go past that i look past that the dog even if the dog would understand the implications of that gun the loaded gun the dog would still throw himself at that attack just like I do. That's love and that's loyalty and that's ethics philosophy. You protect your loved ones. So if I meet that same hunter, whether I know that he has hurt an animal or whether you know it's a stranger or I just know that from other people that's a hunter or whether I have seen him hunt an animal but I wasn't able to help or whatever and I see this person let's say in in a courthouse or in some kind of community building where people come together for a kind of hearing or something or some other event for for a local community that is a public house or, or 
or hall or something. I, and I see that person there coming in and he's taking coffee and getting himself a cookie. And I see that person. I am not going to attack that person. I'm not going to go berserk or do an act of violence verbally or physically. I'm not going to do it because that does not make the community strong. That's not helping anyone anywhere. It doesn't help any animal or any person. It doesn't, certainly doesn't make the offender realize what he's done. If I came after him like this, like a maniac or something, that wouldn't make him understand anything. I've always known that. And I see a lot of people on the internet all the time, all the time, when they start to get convinced by one person to go against another person, when they take a side here or there, then they start to, instead of understanding the entire situation, they will just throw insults at that supposed enemy. They throw insults. They don't know better, you know. But that's why it is so incredibly important that we teach ethics and communication, which is nonviolent communication, and stewardship and all of these things very early on to children has to be taught and people who do driver's license tests or any kind of th situation where they have to get a specific test test done that they have to undergo those kind of classes first you know like a a week long series of classes, you know, like at least for eight days every day for two hours attending ethics classes. You know, that's the least. You know. It could also be done on the internet, you know, where they have to watch certain classes like I know, Stanford University, Dr. Robert Sapolsky, something like this in, 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 the, in the field of ethics. And it will be tested, you know. They can cheat, but they will be tested in the end with the mul multiple choice test. That's what we need to have done so that we know people understand this. So that they really understand it. They listen and they understand. Not in terms of drilling something into people, but in terms of making sure that they really understand it psychologically that they understand that the implications of violent communication, insults, you know, this is the number one thing that people are using. Always, and it's always insults at the person's appearance. That's the strangest thing, you know, it's the whole thing is about something that is internal, something that has to do with personality, with character, character flaws, and the insult that person's appearance. And they all always go back to that. That's something I, I see like everywhere, all the time, all over the place. It's the first knee-jerk reaction. And then other people, they will feed into it by giving these people a thumbs up or saying ha 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 or that's hilarious or you're funny or whatever, you know, like feeding into this behavior, rewarding this kind of unethical behavior. And then it just gets reinforced through this. People need to learn and they need to understand 
that insulting someone's appearance is is violent communication absolutely violent it has killed people it literally has killed people I see unimaginable violence in words on the internet it's a war zone I would like to communicate with people. I would like to be there if someone needs help. You know, like in a chat room, there's always a teenager who is suicidal. I would like to help, you know, I'd like to be there. But you know what? I'm afraid to be bullied. I don't want to be bullied anymore. I'm not a god. I'm not above the clouds or something. I'm a sentient living being, just like the bullies. Just like everyone else, I have feelings. It hurts so much, you know. I've cried so much already over this. I feel insecure about my appearance. That doesn't mean I'm going to have to run out there and go under the knife or buy clothes that cost me a million dollars per year or something and cosmetic and all that. No. No, I'm not a slave to the corporations or to male fantasies or whatever. No, I'm not. I'm my own person. But it still hurts, you know, I still I still cry. But we shouldn't make that our slaveholder, you know, this possible situation that we could be bullied for the way we we appear dorky or nerdy or whatever. I like being a, a, a nerdy dork. I like it. I like it. It's peaceful. It's healthy. <laughs> I like it. It's good. I don't see anything m massively appealing in in all of this, particularly not plastic surgery. And I mean, it could be fun. It could be really fun if you have tons of time on your hands. And a billionaire husband who can send you to a beauty parlor and you can spend all day there or maybe every day, you know, get hair extensions, take eyelashes, makeup done by professionals and go to photo shoots and have the most amazing clothes. Yeah, it could be fun. But not plastic surgery. No, I'm not going. I'm. I'm not endorsing that ever. Okay, plastic surgery is really unethical, in my view. Any kind of plastic surgery. The only surgery that that I just barely tolerate is like reconstructive surgery when someone is injured badly or you know where a bone has to be straightened out okay, yeah. okay i'm making video right now okay making a video making a video <laughs> he's very hard at hearing and it's getting worse every day it's getting worse with the hearing every day and I don't know what to do about it. It's very sad. And I feel, sometimes I feel very alone. I feel like I'm in this bubble all by myself. <laughs> I talk, you know, into the room. At least now I'm talking to my camera. But 
I often talk into the room and no one hears me, um, I mean cognitively. Abstract cognitively. The Papa dog hears, he hears my different feelings and emotions and vibrations of voice and all of this. But he doesn't understand the exact meaning of what I'm saying. So the abstract meaning of it. Now going deep into philosophy. No, the Papa dog's not, not into it. Not in this lifetime. And it's not his... It's not his duty, it's not his responsibility to be there listening to me. And it's not Paul's responsibility either. Nobody owes anybody anything, really. That's why I'm so infinitely grateful for YouTube, even though the website has some issues. It could be done better. It is geared very much into the corporate direction, which is originally when it started. I know it started like 2005 or 2006. They were like very much on board of ethics and not catering to the corporate agenda. We will never have commercials. Ah, that changed very quickly. <laughs> so, forcing loud, com not just commercials, but loud commercials onto people. That's unethical. It's, it's a violation. It's a violation of people's nervous system. It really is. But I haven't seen anyone win in a court case against them with this with that argument. I haven't seen anyone using that argument. I don't have time to sue people. <coughs> I spend my time better than that. I spend my time doing animal rights, activism, signing petitions, writing letters myself to legislators, Talking to people, you know, that was, I thought at times it was very fruitful to talk to people in chat rooms because sometimes there were thousands of people that were reading the comments. Most of them didn't dare to comment. Sometimes people started to dare, started to come out because I was there for them. You know, I gave them the emotional support and it felt good. It felt like, okay, we're making progress here. But then they recruited the haters. I, I don't know, the Muslim agenda, the corporate agenda. They're kind of working hand in hand now. That's also why they're, because the corporate agenda has the Christian church, church completely in their hands. Or completely. The, the Christian church is basically run and owned by the corporate agenda, particularly oil, Exxon Mobil, Lockheed Martin. They brainwash everyone, you know, and, and the corporate agenda brings in Islam as is sort of like the backup, the backup brainwash tool. If the, the one doesn't work anymore, then they have their backup brainwash tool. So, and then you can clearly see it by, by, you know, if you pay attention, a lot of churches that are now embracing Islam, there's still some few fundamentalists that go against it. And the way they go against it is through violent communication which just completely just causes the opposite of what we want to achieve. It's not going to achieve anything. If we want a diet, if we want to heal anything, we have to have a dialogue happening.
and I'm probably not the best peacemaking ambassador in that regard, but I do what I can. I do do the best I can. I'm a truther. I'm a tr truth speaker. For me, this is extremely important. I don't use violent communication. I use nonviolent communication. I listen to people. I, I, I also feel compassion for everyone. I also feel compassion for the people that are doing violent acts too, if I look at it from further away, if I'm not completely in the moment of suffering and feeling and the anger and all of this, then I can see it from above. And I go in and out of this. And I can see their suffering. Yes, I can clearly see this. Someone who's in, who's not suffering doesn't do violent acts of any sort. Someone who is content and happy and enjoying her life or his life, they're not going to attack someone. They're not going to bully anyone. Okay, It's very simple. So someone who is violent, they suffer. Okay. This is very clear. Thich Nhat Hanh also talked about it. I read many of Thich Nhat Hanh's books. Fantastic, peaceful books, peacemaking books. He also uses nonviolent communication and very deep compassion. Very goes very deep into compassion, and so does uh, Marshall Rosenberg. He actually died four years ago at age eighty. He traveled around the whole world creating groups and, and therapy centers. A fantastic person. Fantastic. What a legacy. What an amazing, amazing ethics philosophy he has created and given us, you know, given the whole world. Very nice. And my friend Annalise, my ther my former therapist when I was a child. She definitely learned from Dr. Marshall Rosenberg and even got herself these two hand puppets that they, they must be selling, must be making specifically for his, for his form of therapy. Dr. Rosenberg was also a psychologist, PhD psychologist like Annelies, and she told me a while back, many years ago, she told me that she went into the city trains in Germany with the gir giraffe hand puppet. <laughs> and she got, to the, got strangers to talk to her, and it's really nice. It's really, really wonderful what she did. Annelise did a lot of good work too. She left, left also a, a lot of precious works for us, for the world. Just like Dr. Marshall Rosenberg.
I translated two of her poetry books into English and that one is on Kindle as well. Annalise's story and poetry collection. Nobody bought it. <laughs> it's just such an enormous massive market out there of everyone, every housewife like me is writing now and selling their books on Kindle and it's just too many books unless you have a way of advertising you're probably not gonna find any customers so but whatever that shouldn't deter us from writing books so the most important thing is that we write the books that we do it and I've never gotten notification that any books are sold. Maybe they have, but they just didn't give me the notification. And I don't know how to verify that. But it probably didn't sell anything. But whatever. I'm grateful that we have YouTube and that I can talk to my camera and have a nice, like a conversation, <laughs> a monversation. You know, that's good. It's a good thing to have that. Really good. It's very helpful. It's very relaxing. It's very soothing. It's like having a friend there. And that's what's important. And the situation will continue to go in that direction, of course, where we get the technology, which we need. We have to have it. It's very important. And it's an inexorable process anyway. It is... Uh, it is happening whether people want it or not. Even if they try to stop it, they can't stop that anymore. That process. Things will become more and more robotic and electronic, and that's good. But with it also comes a catch, you know. With it comes more anonymity. With it comes more loneliness, more isolation. People stay at home because they don't even have to leave the house to go shopping. They can get an Amazon food store. It's, we don't have that here yet in this area. But um, even if we did, I would force myself to leave the house because we have to. I don't have a choice. If we give in to that, to the agoraphobia that can that just exponentializes it gets worse if we give in to it so we have to we have to practice going out of the house and i have ocd and i have agoraphobia i have mainly ocd more than agoraphobia i'm afraid of cigarette particles I'm afraid of methamphetamine particles. I'm afraid of cocaine particles. I'm even afraid of alcohol particles. I'm afraid of all, <laughs> like a whole list of, you know, dirty, dysfunctional type of substances that I, I have a real bad phobia with. I, have, I find it super icky. So I find all of this icky, like bars, you know, men with their, with their objectifying of women and this 
quick sex dates I find gross. <laughs> uh, not saying I never did that, but I speak from experience, so it's just gross. It's just horror. My last date, the last casual date I had was with the photographer. And it was the date of hell. It was so hellishly icky and bad. And I mean, the guy himself, I kind of feel sorry for him. You know, I really do. I mean, everything, it's everything about him. It's just so. I feel sorry for him. I really feel sorry for him. He's not a bad person, but. I mean, he lives this. He's a sex addict. And. <laughs> like. The woman is, has become just like this, like flarp, you know, like the flarp. You know, it's not this individual flarp, it's uh, all flarp that I can buy, you know. <laughs> like, not the individual woman for him, but the woman has, as a, <laughs> a general term, you know, the woman get myself the, the woman, a, a dose of the woman, I get a dose of a woman, it could be this woman or that woman, it doesn't matter, it's, it's all interchangeable, just like the flower, is, you know, but I love this particular flower, I love you, <laughs> I don't objectify, I don't generalize this, this particular flop is awesome, and I love it. And that's how I, that's how I view everything material. You know, I'm a panpsychist, so everything is consciousness, and everything is a little different. No slow snowflake is like the other, and I'm a snowflake. <laughs> yes, you bet. And it's good. It's a wonderful thing. Yes, my heart melts and it's good. It's wonderful. I don't want I don't want to change my life with anybody's life. I really don't. I mean, I can really genuinely say that. I really don't want to exchange my life with anybody else. I love myself just the way I am. That's good. And and we all should do it, you know. Everyone should do this. Everyone should love their skin and body and face just the way it is. With its all its uglinesses or, you know, supposedly uglinesses according to measurement of the ideal facial symmetry. You know, you know, there's a woman in Hollywood, an actress, I forgot the name. She apparently has the Hollywood standard Barbie ideal facial symmetry and thus regarded as the most beautiful woman in the world by some people, or I don't know. I saw her, yeah, she's a good person, angel soul, wonderful, great. Um, interesting funny she oh she, yeah that's a, that's her she was um, one of Elon Musk's girlfriends in recent years so. but they broke up but yeah I mean she's really good she's has internal values or he wouldn't be with her of course everything good wonderful woman I'm just saying that you know and I have a right to say my views I don't find her like super sexually attractive or exciting. I just and I really this is this this is how I view things. You know. 
I saw recently, I saw a physicist lady, actually an astrophysicist lady, in the People magazine. And I was like, oh, she is gorgeous. Oh, my God. And then I said, Paul, look, look, she's gorgeous. And he said, interesting, interesting. We always tend to find these, these women that have a little bit more of a masculine face. A little bit bolder facial attributes, you know, like a little bit fatter nose or eyes or cheeks or you know a little bit little bit that he thinks I didn't find anything masculine about her but Paul he thought that she has masculine